Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Takes Season 2, Episode 2, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. You alright? Um, so guys, if you haven't already, please leave a like, and uh, it helps us out. Also, please leave a comment, let us know your thoughts of uh, this episode, and as ever, please subscribe. Um, with that, on this week's episode... Uh, Sam's going to take us through industry, bring us up to speed with everything in the world of film. Then, actually, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing a Northampton filmmaker by the name of Kamal Yudaram. Sorry, Kamal, if I butchered your last name. <laughs> you can tell me about it later. And uh, then we're actually going to be discussing found footage films. So, Sam, over to you for industry. So, Tenet finally was released in America last weekend. Obviously, not in all the markets, but the markets that are open. And box office was 20 million. Now, obviously, in any other situation, that would be like, oh my God, <laughs> what a waste of 250 million, eh? But obviously, we have to take into consideration if those certain markets aren't open, that perhaps they don't want to still go and see the cinema. But at the same time, Disney released Mulan on their VOD site for a premium price of $30, 30 pounds. 19.99. So yeah, it'd be about $30 in America. And it actually worked. People did pay for it, and they had an uptick of uh, interest on Disney+. Plus. It's, um, it's kind of depressing, because obviously a lot of the enthusiasm was that Nolan was going to save Summer. And then his film trailed out at the end of Summer, because it kept getting delayed constantly. And yeah, for a budget of 250 million, um, it's done 150 up from Monday. It's probably got closer to 200 million by now. And Warner Brothers are actually planning to extend Tenet's run which is interesting. And a lot of studios are allowing it as well. They're, they're thinking, okay, let, let one big blockbuster play that will get people coming back because obviously Nolan's work is known for people going back to try and understand what they watched. Hmm. So it could work, but it does, it means that they're going to be pushing their own blockbusters back into 2021. Mulan itself has its own controversy with um, a lot of dodgy business going on with where they shot in the particular part of China is where also those concentration camps are um, towards a certain part of the Muslim faith in that area. And uh, yeah, they're in trouble with that. And I, I, it's early to talk about it, but essentially because of where Trump had sanctioned certain areas of being able to put support there, they took money from there. And it's going to boil over, and it's about time Disney <laughs> <laughs> got, got something, you know, for doing something bad, actually having a response. Well, they're kind of, they're kind of getting a bit of backlash now on Star Wars, aren't they, as well? Yeah, there's been a lot of backlash towards that. And I, I think, it, the thing is, it's Disney. that They've had backlash in the past for things, and they've found a way to get around it. And they will, but it's just nice for the world to stop for a second and go, oh, they're evil, and just be reminded now and then. <laughs> Disney gone messed up. There's a quarantine romantic comedy bank heist film in development with Anne Hathaway and Doug Lidman as director. Um, if all those words made you go, what? Yeah, I was just, I'm looking at your notes and I'm just like... <laughs> That's all we really know about the story. It's got a 10 million budget, so it's quite a low budget film, really. But the quarantine element, the bank heist thing, it's like, oh, is this what we're going to have? A desperation of a lot of quarantine films that aren't up to standards just because they think it's cheaper. And they can get and they can do it. Sometimes that can be innovative, and you can get great stuff like hosts. But are we about to see a wave of just like, oh god, it's another one? Like when we first just constantly saw Zoom things as episodic specials, and you were just like, oh, it's another Zoom reunion. Borat Two has been secretly shot, which is amazing. <laughs> it's yeah. it's completed. It's out to screeners, and they're like, they want to get it out by November for the election, and it sounds very meta. From what I've read, it's about Satch um, sorry, it's about Borat trying to deal with like all the fame that he's gone through by wanting to get back into doing disguises and stuff. So he disguises Satch Cohen, who then disguises other characters, or something like that. And and Epstein's involved in some way with the Trump links, and someone's career is going to be derailed. This sounds incredibly exciting. Borat is one of the best comedies ever made. Yeah. Sure, the fan base got into a very weird point of just shut the hell up. Yeah. Stop doing impressions, weird point. Constantly. But the actual That's comedy nice. of it, <laughs> it was ingenious. And he won a Golden Globe. It got nominated for an Oscar. It made 250 mil around the world. It, was a, it launched his career like everywhere. And it kind of sealed him as being one of the great comedians of our time. So for him to go back to it and not do it in the way that we've seen from Zoolander to 
to a degree, Anchorman to, by him just doing it in his own dangerous way, it's kind of exciting. So I hope it does get released by November. And it's funny because when all of that stuff was uh, coming out, you know, that he'd been seen doing uh, certain stunts in certain places, uh, I was really expecting another season of um, yeah. Who is America, but uh, it, it uh, yeah, this is, it looks this like is much tied more exciting. It does it its film. own way, yeah. So um, <clears throat> the Oscars have changed their standards of how you can be eligible um, film-wise, which will come into place in 2024. So essentially, there are four standards, and you need to hit at least two of those standards. The first standard of, is on-screen representation, themes, and narrative. This can apply to the idea of either a lead or a significant supporting player being from a more uh, from a diverse background. This can also apply to the general ensemble cast. So it's not just about, of course, race. This is also about different people's backgrounds in regards to gender, sexuality, uh, disabilities. Um, so that's for the first one. In standard B, we have creative leadership and project team. Again, it's the same thing being requested. Standard C is industry access and opportunities. And then finally, standard D is audience development. So they can engage with a more inclusive uh, background. So it's really being more equal to everyone. And this is great because the Oscars for a long time has been a white man's club. And it's always been a stigma on Hollywood because its whole history is very murky. If you did come from a different kind of background, you'd be told to wipe that shit up or to repress your sexuality or to know as a woman you're never going to get the opportunity to be able to direct a blockbuster. And things are changing. It's great. There has, of course, been a massive backlash to this idea because people are just reading it as, so what, you can't have a white people only film? And it's like, no, it's not that. Read a bit more. There's a lot more to it. And again, you only have to hit two of these areas. So you can still tell stories about whatever you want. It's just saying, like, look at your cast and crew. It doesn't have to just be the people you know. Try and inv invite others into it because you're going to give them a platform to build their own career just like you have. And I think that's great. And I hope it works nicely. And finally, our friend Michael Fausti, who we interviewed a good couple of uh, months back, He's essentially, um, he's, he had this film called Exit, which has done so well on all the festivals. He's like won multiple awards. It was actually screened at Horror on Sea. I had the, the chance to watch it um, and it's fantastic. It's one of my favorite films of the year. He's now doing a limited exclusive release through Fausty Films. The website should be on the screen as I'm saying this. And yeah, go and buy it. It's a brilliant British thriller. It's got a bit of a sexy element. It's a bit of a Brexit symb um, symbolism in there. There's just this perfect back and forth. It's so singular in like, it's just like nightmarish. It's rare to see someone just doing their own thing and not caring about having to sit into what you expect. It's well worth a watch. Thanks, Sam. Pretty cool. Um, I think Tenant will probably get a lot of their money back through um, digital release, whenever it comes to that. Yeah, and I reckon they'll go for Christmas. Yeah. Christmas is going to be... Big push at Christmas. Time, yeah. Um, so, yeah, moving on. Uh, Sam had the pleasure of speaking to um, the Northampton filmmaker, Kamal Gilderum. Um, again, sorry if I butchered that. Uh, so, yeah, over to you, Sam. Take it away. I'm on Trash House Take with Kamal Yildirim. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, I've been, you've been popping up a lot with um, Horror Screen Vaults, and uh, I know you know Tom Lee Rutter and stuff, so I'm glad you got in touch and wanted to be involved, really, and be interviewed. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the, the spot. More than welcome, man. So let's get into some questions. What got you into filmmaking? Uh, wow, well, I suppose it's the cliche, really. Um, the quiet, introverted kid, <laughs> bullied <laughs> at school, and um, found movies, and kind of, when I found movies, it kind of gave me a little... A place to escape to and it kind of sparked my creative journey really so as a kid I started off about so I was about 14 when when I got my first camera and I started making films then you know making the really bad home movies and it progressed from there uh, to just really hijacking my friends and family uh, every weekend and making short films and then trying to lead up to making a feature film because I always had this notion in my mind that making feature films were easy. <laughs> <laughs> Until I realised how hard it actually was to make a feature film. So it, it, as, a, as a 14, 15-year-old kid, I just used to do it every single weekend. And in that time, I was very much into martial arts and horror films. So it was always a combination of either doing martial arts films or horror films. 
but it, it, yeah so it was just emulating the movies that I loved to watch really as a kid and, and then I made one short film uh, when I was about 18 years old I made one short film which which did, did quite well I kind of got really good feedback on it and people said like, you should take this up you know you've got a bit of a talent here so I ended up screening that short for about 60 or 70 people in in this um, little mini cinema we had in, in Northampton where I'm from and it kicked off from there then it kicked off from there really <clears throat> so would you consider that to be your first short film like the first one that got you that you consider that's the film that it all started from yeah definitely I mean it's called True Blood it's you know, very much a, an old school martial arts type revenge type film which um, very cheesy and I've never showed it to anyone but it's but it was definitely my grounding and it kind of just started started it gave me that notion that I could actually do this as a career and it, or I could do this as a, as a journey in my life that I could take that passion I have as a hobby and turn it into something more. So that was the first, that was the first, yeah. So if you were saying in the beginning you were interested in like martial arts and horror. What kind of stories do you want to tell now? Has that changed or is it still part of it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely progressed from from that. I mean, I still I'm still a massive you know fan of martial arts films, and I'm still a massive fan of horror, and and I'm and my films kind of verge more into the kind of folklore horror as opposed to the kind of gore out horror that I used to watch as a kid. Mm. Obviously, I grew up grew up watching all the big franchises like Freddy, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street films, you know, you know, all those types of films. But I kind of transgressed in my career to working more on psychological dramas and more character-based films um, and I'm much I'm a, I'm a huge fan now of art house cinema so my films have kind of progressed in, into that realm really so they've definitely changed but my love's still there for the, for the horror genre and the, and the martial arts with that being like the the film style um, is there particular stories you want to tell or is it more just the kind of thing of that's the kind of craft sense you want to work with and the story comes later of what the stories attract you? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely themes that I'm interested in and, and my films now are tend, tending to be much more character studies as opposed to, you know, more linear, structured, narrative-driven mm. films. So I'm much more interested in character dynamics and because I'm, I'm a big fan of documentaries as well, so I kind of like to, to weave that cinema verite style of documentary into feature filmmaking because I think it it transgresses storytelling into a different realm and you can kind of because obviously in the West we have a very structured linear way of seeing storytelling and I think now with modern filmmakers that's starting to break down a little bit and audiences are now getting used to seeing films being told in different ways mm. so I'm very much into that kind of cinema myself because I'm a huge fan of you know European cinema Japanese cinema and the way that they tell films has got a slightly different touch to the American and the English way of telling telling stories, and I quite, I quite like that. So, so my own particular <clears throat> way that I want to develop my stories is much more character-based, much more subtextual, and a lot more based on psych- psychological traits of characters as opposed to just dialogue, you know, dialogue-driven films. It's interesting, because, like, I personally completely agree with you, and I remember, like, when I started making films... My first interest was trying to do like features that were dark dramas. And I quickly realised over time that although I liked working with those themes, it wasn't creating as much interest when I worked w- within the horror genre. So you're still yeah. talking about those themes, but you've got genre wrapped around it. It made it a lot easier. And also horror is a lot more fun to explore surrealism or absurdism or um, existentialism within that That's kind of art house horror thing. Definitely, and that, it, that kind of gels. That's why the horror genre kind of still peaks me because it it still it gives you the capacity to kind of explore these themes exactly like, as you're saying, but but still within the realms of horror because horror is such a subjective genre. Mm. It's I don't think it's really that definable horror. I think it, it, horror to you is not necessarily what's horror to me, and that's what I love about horror because it is so broad and so diverse, and I think it's constantly changing. And now we've got filmmakers like Ari Aster and yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Eggers, yeah. who are the huge fan of their work. I think they've got absolutely fundamentally awesome pieces of work. And I think they've kind of take, taken the old tropes of 70s horror and brought it into a much more modern audience and almost exploded the folklore horror uh, 
genre that I'm really, really into myself because I, I grew up watching a lot of British British horror films of like the 60s and 70s. Like I'm a huge fan of the British, um, and I used to read a lot of M.R. James and, and that type of stuff. So I'm very much into that folklore horror myself, and and I think that's a really good. It's a very, very good genre to kind of mix in social subtext that's going, you know, social subtext that's going on around us mm. right now in the world because obviously we're all going through massive traumas around the world, and it, and I think now is a fundamental key for creatives like us to kind of use that and bring it into the kind of films that we want to make, but also subvert that into a positive as well, if that makes sense. And I think the, the folklore genre is a really, really good way to explore that. No, I, com- I completely agree with you. Is this what led towards um, your most recent feature film, Wasteland? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Wasteland has been a passion project of mine for about four, four years. It's been in my head, like this idea, constant idea. Because what I usually do when I create is I start, I don't start off with a, I don't start off with a story. I usually start off with a character. Mm. Because I'm an actor, because I've got an acting background myself, I usually start from a strong character in my head that comes first, and then I explore what world will that character live in, or what world will that character exhibit. So I usually start from that point, and just for me, Wastelands was was always about the subtext and the metaphorical of what's going on around this girl, because it's about mental health, and obviously mm. mental health is so when someone's suffering a mental health illness it's very they're very much locked into that mode and locked into that place and they can't really reach out and let other people ex- understand what it is that they're going through mm. it's an, and it's a very insular place to be and that's what I want to do with Wastelands I wanted to make it very insular like she was stuck within her own nightmare and because I think that represents what mental health really is like as opposed to you know the, the usual you know, tropes that we have in mental health in, in some modern, fil- you know, some films where it just looks like a crazy person being crazy. I'm trying to get to the root of what mental health is because I've, I've seen a lot of mental health in my in my family and I've also myself, I've suffered some mental health issues myself. So for me, it was an interesting, it was an interesting theme to talk about because it's almost like casting my own demons, you know, while also being creative and, and, and obviously creativity is such a great, you know, great facet when it comes to people that are suffering mental health issues anyway. Mm. And it and so Wastelands for me was a very personal journey. It was, you know, stories that I'd seen around me from family members, but also, you know, my own personal journey. And it was just a, encapsulating everything into this very dark, nightmarish folklore tale set in Oxfordshire. And it was it was a dream project because I had a, a wonderful cast. Obviously not including myself because I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I had one, you know, wonderful cast and crew, and we, we worked like a little unit. You know, we really threw ourselves into it, and it was a very dark journey for everyone involved. But it was, it was really, you know, I think it paid off because it's a. I'm really, really happy with the film. I'd say it's my, it's my most complete film to date. I believe. Have you had a chance to um, get some sort of a response? I know you've only recently completed it, but has it? Have you played to an, an audience online, or um, potentially a quick festival, or? Or is that where it's next going? Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 the lockdown kind of put a, <laughs> put a spanner in the works for the for the premieres and the festivals because um, mm. obviously the festival industry at the moment is in a bit of disarray. Yeah. So a lot of films are being turned down because obviously bigger films are getting the spots as opposed to the smaller films. But we've had some good critical responses, so we've had a couple of reviews for it, and it's it's you know it's it is, it's a diversity for it's, it's you know it's a diverse diverse film people are not not everyone's going to like it it's not a normal popcorn type movie yeah, yeah. you know it's like a love it or hate it type of film and I always knew that I wanted to make that type of film I wanted mm. it to have a reaction I wanted people to react to the film um, as opposed to just watching it I wanted that there to be a reaction to it so and so far it's worked because some of the reviewers you know didn't get it and didn't like it and vocalised it and I, and I appreciate that because I appreciate all feedback whether it's positive or negative as long as it's constructive I think it's a really good way to learn as a filmmaker and keep growing because that's what I want to do because I see what I do as an art form as opposed to just you know a, a living or a vocation I see it more much more of a life's journey and 
to get feedback from critics is a really, really great thing, I think. Um, so, so far, we've, it's been pretty pretty positive, actually. It's been pretty positive. We've had a couple of four stars, a couple of five stars, yes. so, you know, and a, and, and a couple of two stars and three stars. So, I mean, it's one of those films that you, you're either going to appreciate because you can attach yourself to something within the story or it's a film that you're totally going to hate, and I, and I appreciate both. <laughs> I really appreciate both kind of responses. So, um, yeah, but so far, I mean, we, I am planning a big premiere once we can get to a point of social, you know, social gatherings, mm. you know, whether it's in a safe capacity or whether it's in a, you know, whether it's in a normal capacity that we used to. I'm just waiting for stuff to kick off. And then so next year, I think, is a, is a year that I'm going to be pushing Wastelands really hard into an audience. Because I think it deserves to be seen because of the hard work that everyone put into it. But also, I think it's a valuable story about mental health and mental afflictions. I think I think you're right with art house horror though. Like art house horror is all about reaction. Like I was talking to someone about the, um, I'm thinking of ending things. Charlie Kaufman's new film on Netflix, and they really hated it. And I loved it, and the fact that we had a long conversation about it I was like, well, that's why the film succeeded because it's created a reaction. You're talking about it, and you 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 you, you shouldn't expect um, a mainstream wide everyone applauding it because it's art house. It's supposed to be a bit more challenging. Exactly. Exactly, and that's why what I love about Art House is that challenging factor, because for me, I can debate film forever, you know, I'm, I'm a cinephile, I've watched so many films, and I'm constantly researching films and looking into all facets of film, mm. so for me, Art House is the perfect genre to sit in, because I want there to be a debate on any of the films that I make, I mean, I made a social realist drama before called Rose, which caused a bit of debate because of some of the subject matter within the film and so I'm always even if I at that particular time it was an art house that I was making I still had that, those elements in my work from quite an, an earlier stage in my career mm. where I was wanting to I was wanting to cause some kind of debate not not necessarily I'm not you know I'm a fan of Lars von Trier but I don't want to try and do what Lars von Trier does yeah, where he yeah. just <laughs> annoys people sometimes just for the sake of annoying people it's not that it's what I want to do in my films if I can ever get to the level that Lars von Trier is is, is is open up a debate even if it's an angry one let's have a discussion about it about it and you're right if you can do that and there's so many films that I've watched that you know like Midsummer, for example it, you know although it's not technically art house it's definitely an art house feel to, yeah, to yeah. Midsummer. And, and the fact that people either really love it or really hate it, don't, there's no one that sits in the middle with Midsummer. You don't go, yeah, it's all right. You know, you, you, you either lo love it or you, you go, what the hell was that? What did mm. I just experience? And that's the point. It was an experience as opposed to sitting there blindly watching a film. And I've got no problem with that because I also like entertainment films. I've got no issue with entertainment films at all. But for me, in my own particular path and career, I want to make films that, that people remember and people talk about and, you know, even if it's in a bad way, they hate it. You know, that's fine as well because because hating something is just as powerful as loving something, in my opinion. You know, the two flip, flip sides of the same coin. Yeah, man. I mean, look at the world. <laughs> that's that's a great definition of like love and hate being just as strong. Look at the state of the world. You know. Um. So this leads quite nicely into your next film, The Haunting of Lady Jane, which uh, Peter Hodgkins yes. from Horror and Screen Vaults is producing. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's probably my, my my most mainstream film that I've done so far because this is a much more mainstream horror, but obviously it's going to have a little bit of my art house <laughs> kind of touches I want to bring into it. But it's it's an old classic ghost story set on the riverways of the British canals. So we're going to be floating down the canals on a on oh, on, bar, on a barge, um, filming on a barge. So we're we creating ourselves as filmmakers, we're creating ourselves a big challenge. <laughs> obviously, trying to film on a barge. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's just that evocative nature of the British countryside, which I absolutely adore. And it's got, it, it evokes so much um, atmosphere without ever having to create a set. You've got so many different locations, you know, in, to play with. So to, for me, it's like this classic ghost story set on the canals with a, a scary spectral being chasing these people that are isolated on this boat. And it's that kind of, it's a cross between a psychological drama and a an intense ghost story. So it's, again, it all fits within the kind of genres I love, but it's much more of a, an attachable... A lot of people can attach themselves to the story because it is that classic ghost story. We do have that classic ghost. I'm very much, you know, lover of, like I said before, Mr. James and, 
and the, the ghost the ghost stories of Christmas that those mm-hmm. types of things that used to play in the seventies. I'm a huge fan of that kind of that kind of stuff, and and this is very much evocative of that kind of thing. That's what I'm going for in terms of style. It sounds very uh, yeah, sounds very. Exciting. We're, we're, we're excited about it. We're really really excited about it. Can't wait to get on with it. Really. Well, it sounds like a very classic kind of goth, uh, gothic tale, but set in a very unique location. So no, it sounds really cool. Um, <clears throat> that goes into production next year. Is that right? It does. Yeah, we're hoping to. Yeah, that COVID permitting, fingers crossed. It, it, we hope to go into production in February. So we're all now f- we're fully cast for the main characters. Uh, we've got a great great cast on that. We've also got a. Uh, incredible which i'm really really happy to be working with we've got a lady called helen udi who was she was in my bloody valentine the original she was in star trek d space nine nice. um yeah so she she's coming from the states to be uh to play the character of ron the, the, the water deity who's chasing these these uh, unwitting travelers along the on the on the riverway so yeah it's really exciting we've got a great cast lined up a great crew we've got you know we just finalized the crew members just this week so we, you know it's all full, full steam ahead you know excuse the pun full steam ahead we're um, ready to rock, rock and roll really we're just tying up the loose ends doing all the usual scheduling and all the rest of it but we're all excited and ready to rock and roll really that's fantastic, man. So my last question, um, I always ask this for people this question, and technically you sort of answered it earlier, because you said that you that Wasteland was your dream project. But let's say you have all the money in the world. What would be the story you'd want to tell? I'm a huge fan of Wuthering Heights. I love it as a as a book and I think I don't I don't think there's been a realistic adaptation of that. And when I say realistic, I mean really get into the meats and bones of the story. So Wuthering Heights would probably be one that I would really, really love to tell because I'm, I always encapsulate love into all of the stories that I do. Love is a big factor in all of the films that I make So, as a theme. So I think Wuthering Heights is that kind of epitome of a love story, but a tragic love story. So mm. I would really, really love to make my own ad- adaptation of that because I feel like it's got so much breadth to the story that there's so much more we could play with and it could get so much darker, which I don't think it has. And the story does allude to the darkness. So I'd love to do Wuthering Heights. I'd love to. I like the sound with, like, it sounds like you have a quite interesting, like, very much the gothic folkness of British, British horror and British yeah. dark yeah. dramas and British dark tales. And that's kind of, it's kind of, um, it, it's, again, it kind of reminds me of, like, with Tom Lee Rutters. Most of his work has a very distinctly British vibe to it as well. And um, oh. yeah, it's interesting. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been, I've always been a, a lover of because I grew up watching it, you know, as a kid on these mm. old TVs. You know, I grew up watching these these, these programs, and it it always kind of sunk in. And it was a place that I could escape to, and it was just the evocativeness and the atmosphere of of that seventies folk vibe. Just it stuck with me. It's always stuck with me, and I've always and as I as I became because I was I was dyslexic. I'm dyslexic, so I was always struggled to read as a kid. Mm. But as I got older and, and I started to read, I started to devour all these kind of old classic literature stories and, you know, the ghost stories and Wuthering Heights really stuck with me and it's ne- never really left me. And it's it's that that kind of evocative nature. There's a kind of atmosphere and an evocativeness about the British, about the old old British and the Victorian period and that kind of thing that really, there's, there's a strength to it. There's a big, for me, it's, it's very cinematic as well. There's, mm. there's a massive amount of cinematicness about that kind of period and that kind of genre. So yeah, I love it. Huge fan. Probably helps actually being more from up north because, like, as far as locations concerned, being right down south in Portsmouth. Don't know why I went American then, but being in uh, South <laughs> Portsmouth, it's very city based, and there is countryside, but it never gives you that sort of. At least to me, I've never felt like that. That folkiness, whereas obviously more towards wow. the mid, uh, Midlands and up north, there's just a bit more. I guess there's more land rather than, you know, I'm in a sea based city as well. Yeah. So it must be a bit yeah, easier I mean, to have the access. I mean, definitely. I mean, where I'm based, obviously, Northamptonshire, the, the Shire of the Roses, it's just, you know, it, it's a beautiful scenery all around Northampton, even though the town is a bit run down, the actual. The actual town itself, the surrounding countryside, is beautiful. Obviously, we've got Princess Diana's estate, you know, in in Northamptonshire. So it's, it is a beautiful part that I grew up in, and I always used to play around the churchyards and 
and the fields around there. So that it makes it sound really idyllic, and it was in a sense it was quite idyllic. Um, but yeah, so I, I suppose that's always played into it because I was always you know one of these kids in my day who used to be out from very early morning till very late at night playing around in fields and, yeah. and churchyards. So I've always had that kind of gothicness about me. So yeah. No one's ever described me as that before, so that's actually quite quite nice to hear because that's something that I'm really into. So, thanks. Well, hopefully it continues through on the reviews and when you do send the films to the festivals. Um, thank you so much for joining us, man. Um, I hope that you send Wasteland into Horror on Sea. Obviously, deadline was last week, but I hope you got the film in to the big one. I didn't. I actually did. I did because uh, Wasteland is a bit of a weird one because it. Some people call it horror, some people don't call it horror. So it, it's one of those ones I didn't know if it would be expected by, accepted by a genre festival. So I'm always a little bit, you know what Art House is like, you don't really know how to categorise it. Yes. Art House doesn't really sit in one box, so it's a little bit difficult to kind of decide whether someone would consider it horror or not. So I would have loved to have had it in there because I know it's a great festival. I'll send you over some festivals to help out. Like Brighton Rocks Film Festival, they'd be totally um, up for that kind of film. There's plenty of it, plenty out there, really. So, yeah, I'll send you some links. Thanks, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you. No worries, man. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Kamal, and I will uh, speak to you later. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Really nice speaking to you. Thank you. No worries. Bye. So thanks for that, Sam. Really decent interview. Um, so this week, guys, we decided to basically discuss fine footage and kind of what, what makes a fine footage film a good film or what defines it. And we, we were discussing earlier on in the week about how, how found footage is, is really defined by um, the way that technology is developed in the, in the normal world. Um, and you can see that from uh, you know, Blair Witch Project, for example, all the way up until the sort of new, new form of found footage films like, like Host and um, Searching. Um, and I, I think it's just an interesting sort of like, it, it's such an interesting genre in the way that it's developed over time, um, coming from, you know, uh, Cannibal Holocaust um, and the way that that sort of utilised elements of found footage and really sort of uh, started seeing film from that perspective of that opportunity to do that. I think it's, uh, it's one of those genres as well that within horror that a lot of people can easily go, oh, found footage, the camera's going to be shaking around, running around, and that's all it's going to be. But people forget that some of the most innovative horror films start from found footage. If we look at, like, Paranormal Activity is a perfect example because that really brought that, I suppose, kind of second wave of constant found footage horror films after that. And Paranormal Activity is such a simple concept it just has, and it's it's also from someone who's the guy who actually directed it. He'd never shot a film before, so it gives it that extra element of really feeling like this is something that could be real. Yeah, and I think with like Paranormal Activity, that was the first um, film of that that time when uh, everyone had high quality cameras. Like it was quite easy to get a high mm. quality camera into. Uh, you know, if you're having an experience like that, that's something that you might actually go and do. Um, whereas before that, it would have seemed a, seemed a bit far fetched. You know, it would have really someone's going to go and get a, a camera just to do that. And if it is, it's going to be blurry, horrible footage. Mm. I think on top of that, um, just to kind of go on from that, is that yeah, maybe not everyone had a like proper decent camera so I think as well with paranormal activity the way that they marketed it it was like it was found footage it was real yeah like and yeah. you watch like I remember the first time I watched that I think it was like 16 or 17 and I believed the hype I was like am I watching something that is actually being shot and they've come across and these people have actually died and um, and yeah, I think that to me was something really, really cool. Well, and that's that's part of what the the fan footage genre has, has always been in some mm. ways. Is like this, uh, this uh, uh, dis like suspending your disbelief to such an extent that you believe this really could be real, and and it scares you because you're like, what what happened to those people? And I mean, Cannibal Holocaust. I, I mm. think you were going to say about that. Actually, <laughs> but, I'm, I'm, I was. Um, I just want to say a quick comment. Like, if we think of the the form of film itself, mm. most. Um, if we think of documentary, documentary is non-fiction. It's real life. It's what. It's someone documenting events. So I think that really helps when you have that found footage because you can just tie it a little bit closer. There, you're not trying to pick up a narrative of film saying, 
this film was taken from December 2009 or something mm. like that, you know. It's, it's placing you in a mindset to go, this is a documentation. This is, I'm going to be watching a documentation of someone's horror. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but that's the thing is that with sort of uh, uh, changing technologies and, you know, the, the mobile phone cameras and everything mm. like that, that's become so much more expanded now. I mean, like the the bay, for example, that takes all of yeah, that footage yeah. from CCTV cameras to mobile phones to uh, uh, TV footage and everything like that and combines it all to give you this bigger bigger story. Well, this is it. And as you were saying, it all began with Cannibal Holocaust. Mm. Cannibal Holocaust is... At least I'd say one of the landmarks of found footage horror. Because I can't say for sure if there wasn't someone else doing a similar thing beforehand. Of course. Because there always is. But the one that was a landmark where people went, oh my God, is this real? Went to quite extreme. The actors who were involved, they actually, um, they had to go to court. They had to come into court to prove they were alive. Because the director, they'd seen this and they thought it was a snuff movie. They just thought it was a full-on snuff movie and these people being killed... And they had to prove they were alive. <laughs> that's really? that's that's what the level that? That, uh, that was the 80s? 1982. Oh. So this is during the video nasty era as <clears> well, <throat> where they were doubling down on any sort of gore and violence and making sure it was being repressed. And of course, before that, I, I remembered when you mentioned the um, snuff element, the peeping Tom. Um, that is uh, to us, uh, I think that I was... I wouldn't say that's perspective of the camera, but it's yeah. mostly like uh, normal narrative. But it, it, to a certain extent, it would fit into that kind of found footage. Um, I, I don't think they would have called it that at the time, but... Um... There's a film called Faces of Fear that was in the 70s, and that proclaimed itself to be a found footage oh. snuff movie. And it's very underground, and it's not, it's not real, but they really wanted you to have that feeling. And again, that happened again in the 80s. After Cannibal Holocaust, there was a series called uh, American Guinea Pig which is so extreme that they label themselves as snuff, snuff movies. Mm. And you, the whole idea is you're questioning, well, what's real and what's an effect here? Because it's extreme. And there is that side where it is that, that how extreme can we go? But then if we go back to that more simpler idea of, of convincing people that something's real, Blair Witch Project. I was yeah. just about yeah. to say that. I, I genuinely, the first time I watched it, I watched it on video when I was 11. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that was quite scary. And then I saw the credits and saw their names, and I was like, oh my god, this is this is real people. Well, this is the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. And it just changed my whole mentality. And obviously, afterwards, when you get older, you look into how it's done, and it's a uh, well, it was an amazing advertising, wasn't it? Whenever, yeah, exactly. Whenever I first watched it, but like yourself, I freaked out because I was probably what ten, and it was the strangest I think it was the first experience I'd had with found footage mm. so to me it was all real and like you say looking into the research of it whenever they cast the people they actually didn't tell them certain trigger things so like the crew would go around setting up all these different um, sort of figurines and stuff that are in the film and they actually freaked the cast out <laughs> genuinely so a lot of it is genuine um, reactions from the cast um, from the actors and stuff but yeah it really freaked me out the first time I watched it yeah I think um, I was a bit older and I knew it was all fake yeah. and by that point like it had all come out um, but it still scared the shit out of me because it's so it's I, I think what it does that, that previous sort of uh, films uh, of that kind of found footage thing it, what it managed to do was to was to take you into the supernatural yeah. and, and make you kind of believe the supernatural by ma- by making it so distant that you can't you don't ever see it it's just something that's happening that you can't quite explain um and and by doing that, they they managed to make it so believable that it it, it was terrible. It's a fear of the unknown. Yeah, mm. I think that's an interesting point as well because when you're filming something, like if you're just filming someone walking around, you can go, okay, there's a tree, there, there's a person there, blah blah blah. So when you're watching a found footage film and you're seeing this documentation, you're seeing all the things that you're used to. So when you see those small moments, like what Blair Witch does, or to a, uh, if you remember um, Willow's Creek, by Bobcat Goldthwait. Willow's Creek is a well is a not a werewolf. It's, Willow's Creek is um, a Bigfoot film. It's about this couple who um, they're documenting just being out on, on outside by themselves, and there's clearly some sort of sign there's a Bigfoot there. And there's one continuous shot for about 18 minutes where they're in the tent, and you're just with them, and you're just with their fear, and you can just hear there's something around them, and it just builds and it builds, but the camera stays where it is, and you never see Bigfoot. You just hear that effect of it being around. So it's that intrusive nature that they're filming to get those memories of 
you know, things that they're familiar with and then something from the outside breaking in and it disturbs you when you see a little distortion of something a bit weird and odd within what you think is normal from the way you view things. It does make you go, oh, what's that? Mm. I think that's what good found footage does. It takes you quickly away from reality to bring in, like you said, a supernatural element or horror in general. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that the way that it develops on itself is really um, interesting because, mm. you know, when you look at Cannibal Holocaust and... and um, uh, the Blair Witch Project, the the explanation for them having cameras was because they were film students. Yeah. Whereas, like as you go on, that sort of that explanation as to why they have cameras drops away um, because they you know anyone can film anything, mm. and um, I think that's like a, I think that that sort of that just changed the genre so much and opened it up and then we saw just a flurry of all these um, found footage films yeah, yeah. I mean you even think of films like um, Afflicted yeah. where that couldn't have been made as a, a found footage vampire it's film it's like a travel um, kind of thing isn't yeah it? and they're wearing like GoPros and stuff as they're travelling mm. around to, to show the experience of being on holiday um, but you see the whole transformation of the vampire from this perspective and like it, it's really it, it, it just shows how much um, how inventive how, you can yeah be. how how many possibilities there are with it's the with same with um, Wreck Wreck is a Spanish horror film it was remade as uh, Quarantine that whole s formula is that these are a news team who are basically interviewing local firemen and they get taken to a tower where there's zombie demonic possessed kind of things but again you're put into a format that you recognize you, you recognize a new support you go along with it and then all of that changes when you're with them and they're fit in some ways found footage can be the closest you could get to having more empathy when it comes to horror because you're witnessing the scene as it's happening you know it's mm. it's almost like you're there yeah and that's it it's, it's all about who's filming it and why there's always that reason as to why i think that's why with found footage horror, like, you can experiment with being more documentary-esque. It depends on the initiative and the reason as to why they're, they're doing horror, you know? Mm. And, and it's, it's a real shame that there was a, a, a lot of crappy found footage horrors that came out after Paranormal Activity that gave it a bad name. Well, the, the next lock of Paranormal Activities. <laughs> yeah, it was just copies. And to be honest with you, and then every studio was trying to find their found footage, either horror or action, or trying to be like, oh, we can do it because it's cheap. It's cheap, and if we just do the same tricks that those ones did, it'll be fine. Mm. But audiences aren't that stupid. They can recognise when something's being flogged. Well, I think it needs to have a good story as well, and it either needs to be a good story in terms of pulling you in and making you feel that it's mm. realistic or, or giving you characters that, that you're you know, interested in or intrigued yeah, by. Yeah. I think it's interesting, though, because like, there are some opportunities that could have been cool, though. Like, there was always a rumour that the Friday the 13th was gonna, they were going to do a found footage Friday the 13th. And everyone was like, oh, God, they're flogging it now. But in hindsight, I'm like, that would have been cool as hell. You know, it would be a very different take on it. You'd have to do yeah. Jason a whole different way. You wouldn't be focused on being with him stalking. You know, it would have been a whole different perspective. And I think that's what people, they need to take that snobbery when it comes to found footage. You're going, actually, you can explore things in a very different way. You wouldn't, yeah. you don't have a problem with documentaries, so why would you have a problem with someone capturing all those moments? If it's done well, it's done well. You know? I think the, the issue is, like, the issue that I have, so I'm not a massive fan of fine footage. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Wait and see all the hate comments. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not a massive fan, and the reason for it is like, whenever it first, whenever I was first introduced to it, and I seen like the first number of found footage. I, I remember seeing Quarantine in the cinema, yeah. um, and I thought, oh, that's really cool. And I'm, like an image that stays with me is when I think it's at the end, and she gets dragged away from the camera, and it's all green, and it's like, whoa, that's crazy. But then because there was this massive influx of fine footage, yeah, fine footage, yeah. fine footage, and then it is went it into cheap? like social media and you have, uh, I think there was like unfriend or friend or something. And, Unfriended, yeah. And it just became really stale for me. I think it's a bit like you, Jackson, with the Nolan effect. It's that when yeah. there's so much of it, it just becomes and it, like, too much. It becomes too much. I remember watching the new Blair Witch Project and after about 10 minutes... I like the original, but after about 10 minutes of this one, I was like, no, I can't do this. Like, I feel sick <laughs> with the amount of times they're moving this camera around. That is the interesting perspective as well, because that, that, like, a lot of people do have that with found footage, that they can't physically handle it. It's like Cloverfield as well. Yeah, and, and I, I completely respect and understand that. That's why, personally, I have more of an interest when they're doing a documentary style. Mm. There's a film called um, The Sacrament, 
And the sacrament is, it's, it's a fascinating way they do it. They do it like a vice documentary. And it's about a bunch of people going to see a cult, essentially, but it's Brian Jonestown massacre. Yeah. And it's terrifying. And although it's that human side, and that's the other thing with found footage, you can play with what's unknown, but you can also play with what is definitely known. Mm. And humanity can show its most ugliest sides when it's being filmed constantly. And I think that's what I've always liked about found footage. I think it's one of the reasons why we've done it in our own films. We've made a lot of found footage horror films or docu-horrors, depending on how you want to call them. And with Lonely Hearts and uh, The Truth Will Out, <clears throat> they were very much definitely looking at the human side as opposed to the more supernatural side of things. Because you are, you're capturing every little like secret, every little moment that, that they're experiencing. And again, it's, as a documentarian, your job is to find those moments. Mm. So I think, I think that's the one contrast you could say with found footage is they're not trying to find those moments. They're supposed to just keep within their own moment as they're, you know, documenting it. I probably, just to say, I probably shouldn't have said that I don't particularly like found footage because the first <laughs> feature film that I directed is a found footage <laughs> film. <laughs> but then you took your own style with it because yeah. you decided to do it as... There's a lot of steady cam and stuff because yeah. they're setting up for different shots and stuff and it follows like a, a documentary crew almost. This is it. You, we took a, a different a take of it. We wanted to do it like a most haunted episode. So you, you're looking at what they do as their structure and then building your own story. Yeah, well, absolutely. I think, I think that's what you can do interestingly with found footage Definitely. that you can... Uh, it's about the motivation of of filming in the first place as well so you don't you, it's not like these events are just taking place and the camera you know mm. the, the, so forget happens. the cameras there it, it sort of breaks that that illusion and makes sure that you have to understand why someone's filming it or yeah, what yeah. they're what they're doing it for or you know giving a rationale behind it i got a chicken and egg scenario for you here yeah There's something <laughs> that's been playing my mind what's been discussing so you're this about to talk about dinner or something <laughs> <laughs> We have found footage, yeah. And at the same time as when found footage has its popularity points, we have a spike in paranormal videos. Mm. And it's, again, it's technology uh, connection. So in the 80s, there's a lot of films about paranormal investigations because more people had video cameras and they were filming what they thought were incidents. We then go to the 2000s after Blair Witch and then later on with, of course, uh, Paranormal Activity. Again, an uptick of paranormal videos. So is it chicken and the egg? Is it the films that make people go, there could be something around them? Or is it the technology that's allowed them to try and investigate what they think is happening? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. brings the film afterwards. Yeah, I think it's got to be a bit of both. It's an interesting idea, though, because they're definitely tied together. And I yeah, absolutely. It and it definitely, in, like, watching films like that and, and being able to do it yourself, it, it, it does inspire you to think, like, oh, I could just I could just do, like, a little, you know, mm. little creepy video and stick it online and, you know, spread it round in, in some kind of a way. But then um, at the same time, your motivation is that you're curious. So yeah. even though you're making that film to sort of be artistic you still have an idea of doing that so it's still but it's still within the possibility of the technology as well yeah, you yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Make that kind of thing and distribute it on youtube back in even like the early 2000s it wouldn't have you know you wouldn't have had so many people uploading ghost videos onto onto a massive site like that it's an interesting one isn't it because um because obviously, like, it's not saying every found footage movie is connected to people filming ghosts, but it is that, that DIY aspect. It's a very key player because, again, most setups of found footage films is you're going to see them working out how to use the camera, especially if it's not from a documentary crew. You will still, mm. you'll still see, oh, have you got a battery, blah, blah, blah. I think in it older needs... films, older found footage, that's more prominent. No, you still see it because it's a technology <coughs> connection. Because even in host, at the beginning point, they're working out the zoom connection. They're finding out they've got filters and stuff. And if you look at these films, they, they all found footage has to start with them understanding the technology, getting used to it and starting to document. And then, of course, the outside thing happens to it, where it then becomes their only connection. Yeah. I mean, even in um, Paranormal Activity, where they've... I, th I think they buy the camera for the purpose of yeah, catching yeah, ghosts, but you still see him playing about with it and getting to learn it and stuff. Of course, it's, it's a good way to build the characters, yeah. but it's so important because, again, when we pick up a camera for the first time to document something, we might not necessarily know how that camera works. And yeah. you do do little test shots. Yeah. And found footage is supposed to be a collection of the footage found. So mm. it makes sense, right? And I think it allows you to connect the character and the camera and the motivation yeah. in one kind of uh, uh, scene that then allows you to sort of believe the rest of what is going on and to, and to be with that character. See, that's the key thing with most found footage. 
believability. Mm -hmm. As a filmmaker, we try to build a reality as it were, but it's more of a fantastical world. It's more of a world that you've allowed your own film rules to apply to. With found footage, you have to build some sort of, I know what this is. Yeah. I know what this, I know I've seen these people. And that's why I feel like the best found footage ones, the characters are memorable. And I think um, going back to host, the fact that those four girls are constantly interacting with each other and Teddy. I always forget about Teddy. <laughs> but they've always, you've, they've got that chemistry just for the first part where they're just getting used to the technology and catching up with each other. And then you bring in the horror later. Mm. And I just feel like um, found footage can be the, one of the more, kind of the closer to reality basically than, yeah, than it's, you can it, with it, other horror types. It's both, it's both freeing and restrictive because yeah. you wouldn't want to make a found footage surrealist film. It was just, you couldn't, I don't think you could make that because how would you, uh, how would you comprehend that in mm. some ways? No, I, I think you're right. That's, That's not a challenge, Sam. <laughs> don't go and write a surrealist fan footage. You film. know he will. <laughs> but you're right, there is those restrictions because you have to think, well, what are they actually going to be filming? Are mm. they going to film every moment? And are we moving with the camera's constant movement or are we seeing it from different camera's perspectives? Mm. And again, you have to legitimise where are those other cameras coming from? But it's, 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 again, it's building a reality that people are comfortable with so they can go, okay, I know that's a GoPro up there. Because otherwise they're like, where's that camera? Why is that camera moving that way? <laughs> I, I tried to do a similar thing in Industrial Animals. I established a found footage kind of format. And then I was like, like this is my reality. Fuck the found footage. <laughs> and I had the camera doing whatever it wanted by the end of it. And it really confused people. And it's interesting because you've created a comfortable blanket of this is reality and then gone, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's what found footage can allow. Mm. Those kind of harsh restrictions kind of give you the, the freedom to experiment further in mm. some ways. So. Cool. Well, guys, thanks for listening. And um, we hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Like I said, if you did, please drop us a like, leave us a comment and let us know your thoughts. Um, and if we missed any found footage films that you thought were really good, yeah, leave a comment. And as ever, please subscribe. Check out our website, www.trasharts.co.uk. There'll be a link in the description, so you can go look at that. And uh, other than that, guys, thanks for listening. Trash Arts Takeout. Bye. ta -da.